the warmest of greetings to you, and welcome to Happily Ever Teaching. This is the podcast to help you enthrall your learners in a knowledge-rich curriculum using the best teaching method known to science, storytelling. To do this, we feature special guest educators who are passionately keen to empower your children. I am storyteller Chip Cahoon, and with me today is... Hi, I'm Helen. I'm a teacher in a small primary school in Northamptonshire at the moment. I teach year one and two. And I'm Nicola, and I'm teaching in a school in Southampton. I've been involved in primary education for 28 years, and I've also taught at university, hopefully inspiring another generation of teachers as well. And today we are exploring what English we can teach with an incredible story created by a pupil from the year three and four class of Kern Engain Primary School. You can listen to the story by downloading our sister podcast, Fables and Fairy Tales, or search our website, epictales.co.uk, for Bright, Brave, But Broken. There you'll find a video of me telling the story that you can share with your children. And if you're an epic educator as of January 2023, you'll also get the story as a special edition paperback, brightly illustrated, there it is again, brightly illustrated by Mario Coelho, a special large print edition that's perfect for shared reading and including 16 written lesson plans based on the discussion we're about to have. Don't worry if you missed that, though, as you can also order the book from any bookshop, including Amazon, and educator members of our Epic Book Club can access the ebook and lesson plans through the Epic Tales app. In fact, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank everyone who's signed up to our book club so far, because by doing so, you're also supporting this podcast, so we can keep sharing these off-the-shelf lesson ideas every single week. Right now, though, let's continue our discussion with Helen, Nicola, Billy and GZ and I suppose Alex, too. We're coming up to National Storytelling Week, which is one of the reasons why we picked this story to start off 2023, because this was a story that really did come from the head of a young eight to ten year old in a year three to four class. They came up with this entire story after doing a few workshops with us when we'd been sharing folktales with them. We got them to share folk tales back. And that really is the power of stories. The, the more you share them with your young learners, the easier they then find it to create and tell their own. I think it comes from just having that broader understanding of what makes a story and chapter books are are great and and longer books and and longer stories are are fantastic absolutely but the great thing about folk tales is that they are shorter so you can very quickly get a much broader understanding of different story types out there can't you if you're if you're sharing lots of different folk tales so that's where we started from with the the concept for this opening series of happily ever teaching and i wonder folks whether you have continued that with your explorations into English. Let's start at the lower end of the primary spectrum, ages four to seven. Helen, where's the the English that you found in Billy's Quest? I thought that a great place to start would be the idea of a quest story, because Mm -hmm. as you say there, you can create a short but effective story just with that pattern of a character that's got something to achieve and they have to go Mm -hmm. on a journey to find it. They've got problems to solve along the way. That structure really appeals to me and encouraging children to make up their own stories because it's, it's very easily adaptable. Mm-hmm. You know, the way that t- we teach in primary school is the children learn a, st- a story or a text well and then they adapt it and to create their own. So I thought it would be a really good opportunity to do some storytelling and story writing with the younger age range. And with the youngest, youngest ones, lots and lots of just storytelling and getting children to make up their own stories mm. and go on a quest through role play um, and outdoors. And I have this image in my head of, of children out outdoors creating you know different stations <laughs> going on the quest to solve the problems yeah. and reaching reaching the stories and then with the sort of as you're going into year one year two um particularly year two children writing their own quest stories i think they'd really enjoy owning a story in that way and one that they've carried out they've been on a quest in in drama and role play i think i've done it before where it's even something like within the school building they've got a quest to do something i think there was something lost Mm. and i hid it i can't remember it was a long time ago so they had to go on a quest to find this lost thing actually in the school building Uh, and and then solve problems along the way all through drama like a treasure hunt kind of thing like a scavenger hunt hunt, yeah solving clues along the way to work out where you got to 
go to next. Yeah, and then yeah. the children have lived that story. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And then you use that for them to plan their story and write their story. And in the early years, you know, heading heading towards the summer term, the children that are confident writers, and even if they're not confident writers, they can make up a story of three three or more sentences and get them mm-hmm. get them to write down their story as well with that very clear structure. And if they've lived it, if they've if they've done it themselves, um, something I really like to do is take photos of them. So they're in this, you know, Uh, and then that you use that as a story plan. You use that plan to practice telling the story over and over again, because, of course, if the children can't tell their story, they can't write it. And then you write the story and make it into a book. Well, I can absolutely vouch for the potential success of all of those ideas because they're very similar (laughs) to stuff that we've done ourselves. And I I think you're right. That's the great thing about the quest is that as a skeleton, it's a very simple Mm. structure, but it can be in a whole range of different settings. It can have a whole range of different characters and a whole range of different goals and the choices that you make for character setting and end goal are going to actually very quickly change the story so it looks completely different you know if Billy had been I don't know a a tiger looking for its roar for instant uh, that's going to very quickly change how the ending would look and the type of obstacles that it would need to have the, the sorts of things that it would find an obstacle in the first place and the sort of setting it's going to be in and yeah it can really help young kids to make a story their own and ju- just picking up on your comment there about kids who are maybe struggling to write or not keen or able writers yet giving them the opportunity to create and take ownership of their own story like this is is a really good way of encouraging them to actually want to write because you can say to them this is a fantastic story yeah. wouldn't it be great if we could share this with other people people you know we we want to share this back at home let's make sure we don't forget it let's make sure we can share it maybe with the next class next year and once they appreciate the idea of of having their story shared around like that and the need to record it that motivates them towards writing and, and quite often when we've done this with with schools teachers have just had their jaws dropping because they've seen how much writing their children have gone on to produce. And I think it's because before maybe the the desire wasn't necessarily there or the motivation wasn't necessarily there um and i'm just thinking now wouldn't it be great if you actually could share with every new reception class as as your kickstarter for the project the stories that your last reception class had created i often find that children are really motivated by making books for the book corner and you know when i say to the class you know we're going to write this and we're going to turn it into a book so then we can read it it's more motivating than writing a story in their English books. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, often we'll write them in the English book first and then write them up Mm. neatly for the the class book. But yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's all the editing process, isn't it? And another one that I often return to when I'm working on writing workshops with kids is Charlie and the Chocolate Factory had seven different versions before the the one that you got to see in. Yeah, yeah. Seven different versions (laughs) before it was finally published. So even if you go on to become a hugely successful writer like Roald Dahl, you're still going to be writing multiple versions and editing and, and trying to get it right. Did you have anything else for English? I think when I was reading this story through, I had very clear pictures in my head of the chunks of the story because the chunks of the quest and, mm. and something I've done with young children before is to make a cartoon strip of part of a story because with early years and key stage one I often get them to draw pictures anyway of the story that they want to write so previously I've introduced them to the idea of a comic strip mm-hmm. and then they've had a great time drawing each step of of part of the story you know you, you wouldn't do the whole story with this uh, but you might yeah. take the part where they come across the the lava pit and the the bridge is broken and get children to think about each little step draw a sequence of maybe four pictures and I've done this you know you do it on A3 paper so they've got plenty of space once they'd done that what what I did was I cut out speech bubbles for them for the early years key stage one they can cut their own out it's fine um, <laughs> and, and then they and then they learn about speech and what the characters would be saying at each phase and they stick the speech bubbles on yeah. so they've got a, a comic strip and they just loved that I think I, I think I it was it was just a bit different that's a brilliant idea really visual 
and memorable. They were so mm. excited. Um, I think it was a time when we'd been doing quite a bit of writing and I was, I've been, you know how you, you do the same ideas and I was just a little bit like, oh, what can we do next? <laughs> what could be a little bit yeah. different? <laughs> um, and the children li- loved it and it can then lead on with your year, year twos particularly into actually writing maybe a script or writing something with speech marks. So you extend them a little mm. bit that way, but start off with the comic strip and get children thinking about speech. What will the characters say? I mean, there are so many different ways of presenting stories because yeah you can write yes you can use comics you can use just art you can use poetry you you mentioned scripts there as well and kind of getting the vision now of having almost like a deck of cards or a a die or something where which you roll or or choose from in order to decide what medium you're going to use today (laughs) that's a good idea i like that (laughs) what should we do today i just think over the over the term you just have to have a variety of all of them so actually it doesn't matter sometimes which one you choose as long as do it over different times yeah we, we tried to do that in fables and and fairy tales as well so you've got some stories that are entirely in poetry some that yeah. are uh, very short um, some that are more visual we, we haven't had any scripts yet so so maybe we need to do that we need to, <laughs> we need to have a script in our series as we move on up the ages though uh, ages 7 to 11 what, what have you found for us Nicola on the English front? Okay from a sentence level sort of start there's quite a lot of examples of literacy features like alliteration mm. um, yeah. fantasy flocks for the starling things fancy formations for the, the geese. Owl really likes his alliteration, yeah. doesn't he? <laughs> and it's quite, good, quite it? obvious. So actually, that could come out of the text. And also synonyms, choosing different mm. vocabulary to mean the same thing also, I think, comes out quite well as well. So they could be good talking points. I think you could quite easily take mm. one of the paragraphs. So for example, the paragraph that begins, Billy was ready to climb the mountain right away. But remember, he was a bright bird, a sensible bird. That paragraph's got quite a lot of different punctuation in it including colons and 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 so on and i just think you could potentially take out a passage from the text and take out the punctuation and Mm. put it in so i think there's some really good examples there and even parts of the speech you you mean leave leave your kids to put it back in yeah they have to put it in you know we've got mistakes here try and spot them because i think you know i know we're talking about the big picture like narratives and so on and absolutely that that shines from this story but i think looking at the language features and punctuation would be a really good call as well would you count stressing a word as punctuation um not, do you mean like when it's in italics, that sort of thing? Yeah, because I'm just looking at that paragraph now and I see the word sensible. I think I would probably discuss with the children why it was in italics. I don't think you could... Okay. That's not really punctuation, but why has the reader done that? What difference is it when you say it? Yeah, I'd definitely discuss why it's like that. Mm. Absolutely. And whether they would maybe choose a different word to stress. Yeah, or they might put inverted commas around the word sensible and that, that could work for punctuation. Mm. So yeah, no, that's, mm. yeah that's, that's the first starting point. But sort of slightly more um, along the same lines as Helen, really. It's a great one for narrative. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't avoid it, yeah. can you? <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone remembers Pi Corbett, his sort of ideas, sort of talk for writing. Yeah, and this would work really well for younger children as well. But actually writing the story in pictures so that the children can see the sequence events and then retell the story but then changing this was probably more for year three and four sort of seven and eight year olds but re then telling the story with a different idea within the concept of the framework of the story and even our Mm. our children who aren't reaching expectations in year five and six really need support and scaffolding and the idea of if you've drawn the pictures of the whole story and you've seen the sequence that then they can use that as a basis to write their own story and adapt so they they Mm. come up with something that they a character wants to achieve and using the same framework of the structure in the story to to write it themselves it's it's quite a long story i mean it's actually one of the longest stories i think i've i've read for the podcast is it really yeah so it's just over two thousand words okay well maybe maybe it's too big of one but i also quite like the um (laughs) (laughs) sorry the way the way it's written as well it is quite a long story it is is a long story and and i think that's why drawing and sequencing the pictures would help because children obviously wouldn't write that many words Mm. it has a lot of moments doesn't it and and you do you do go literally from the bottom of a mountain right to the top so there's a very specific scenes definitely and 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 actually going from the pie corbet of idea of telling the story the children could potentially tell the story in their own words to a friend and adapt the the main reason at the end of what they were what the character's trying to achieve but then maybe right 
do it into an audio book. We don't always have to write things down. Mm. It could be that they tell the yeah. story and then that's recorded and then that's shared with the you know, parent. You know, they can listen to each other's stories at bedtime yeah, stories I or love something. That idea. Really? Yeah. So, but again, I think that would work for younger as well. I don't think it's necessarily yeah. generic for the older children. And then and then writing it or typing it up as well. I quite like the voices that come across in the story as well. The fact that you've got you're telling the story, you've got your past tense, you've got present tense, and it, it's addressing the reader. Mm. A lot of stories tell a story. Yes. But this one's actually saying, right, reader, you are involved. You are part of this. We're a collective voice. <laughs> I to really help. like that. Yeah, aspect. I do. And and I think yeah. that that's unusual. And it would be quite nice to for the children to when they're writing the story to bring that in. Did either of you watch the, the video that we made for this? No, not yet. Sorry. No need to apologise. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> you got lots on your plate. The fact that you're reading it is incredible. But yeah, in, in the video version of this, the way that all of our storytellers do it, I think, is that we take on the character of Al just for the moment where he introduces that little mantra in order to get the audience participation for it. And the very very first iteration of this story after we heard it from Alex, we turned it into a theatre show. We, we had Arts okay. Council money to turn some stories that we'd heard from the kids in our workshops into uh, a theatre performance. And this was one of the first that we oh, got brilliant. to take on national tour with with that funding. Wow. This this was actually a script mm. before it was uh, the, the version that you've got there. And it was a, a thought when we did the video, that was really easy because we literally told the story and then had had Al take over in order to get the audience participation and then we go back to being a storyteller again and when it came to writing it down I was thinking how can we actually get that into mm. into words and have the same feeling of participation and for me the, the only way to do that really was to tell it from Al's point of view all the way through so I'm glad you've picked up on that Nicola and I wonder whether you could have that sort of conversation with your young learners actually get, get them to see the text as it's written down and then I don't think we've ever really discussed this before but compare it to the version that you can find on our website, uh, the, the version where I'm actually telling it to your mm. young learners and see whether they can explain some of the differences that they see. My idea is similar, really. You've kind of got a formal storytelling technique and then you've suddenly got really informal language of what people say and how they say it and the voices that come through. And again, that's sometimes really hard to teach, yeah. but because it, it's so explicit here, it could be something that's, that's brought out, you know, that's awesome, dude, mm. someone says, you know, it's kind of that informality formality that um so having a shift in formality which which is mm. for the upper age range is is something that we teach so you know the idea of recording um the children's telling the stories for an audio book but also mm -hmm. you could interview the characters for a radio broadcast in the same sort of way so it's yeah. using um using a different that's a great idea. rather than always writing oh, things down awesome. but yes and then again you could then <laughs> yeah. go into a report or newspaper report if you wanted to but i would say you know, interviewing the characters because it would bring the PSHG out quite nicely as well about how they felt at different times mm. on the journey yeah. so it could link all those things together yeah and, and well and of course that is actually how reporters work isn't it they mm. they go out and they record conversations and then they go back to their office or their study or whatever and they turn that into a report so that that could be a really great way of, of writing a report rather than imagining yeah. conversations actually role play them instead that's all we have time for in this episode, folks. If you'd like to talk to us about anything you've heard in this podcast, or if there's a subject you are soon to teach that you'd like us to cover, you can find us on social media using at Teach Happily, or leave us a review using your favourite podcast app. Please also share this podcast with your colleagues and help us start a story-led revolution in classrooms around the world, so children everywhere can enjoy knowledge-rich learning in a way that's effective, memorable and enjoyable all at the same time. Just a reminder that you can also get these lesson ideas as written lesson plans in the special educator edition of Bright, Brave but Broken by finding it on Amazon. Or have new collections of stories and lesson plans from all across the curriculum sent to you every single month by joining the Epic Book Club. Check our show notes for details or visit epictales.co.uk. Tomorrow, Billy and GZ will help us teach maths. But right now, it only remains for us to say cheerio, and we hope to hear your story soon. So, cheerio! cheerio. And, and we, we hope, hope to hear your story, story soon! soon.